Hello and welcome. Today is the uh, the next knockout round of the Excel World Championship. And I've been posting all my videos of, of the four different cases from day one. I realized that those were all my live attempts and a little uh, flustered in some cases, shall we say. Uh, so I thought what would be interesting for today would just be to do a sort of day one recap, partly you know, to make this vaguely more educational content for you and also partly just for my benefit to think back over so basically, my plan is to spend, I don't know, like three to five minutes in each case, just talk about the good and the bad design choices that I made and the implications that those had. Um, so I, I'm not going to kind of introduce the cases in any great level of detail. If there's any you want to dive into more, there's a full video with a walkthrough of that. With with reading that, you can get the case online, whatever, I don't care. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to do them in the order they came up. Uh, so this one is Pass the Arrows by Peter Scharl. Uh, you can see this weirdness going on here is because at some point I unmerged every cell on the page because the merged cells were driving me crazy. That was probably one of my good choices, actually, because you know when you try to select uh, you know, things across multiple levels like this. If this cell is merged, uh, then let's just <clears throat> do it. So you try to select from there to there and you get this mess. Um, and for the bonus questions, you're often looking to look across multiple levels. So <laughs> that was probably a good decision, except that then I had to remerge the instructions to be able to read them because obviously that's not very helpful. Uh, anyway, uh, what were the, the bigger decisions here? I think the, the biggest <clears throat> kind of turning point for me on this one was uh, the use of lambdas. Um, so there's a, a funky scoring rule here, which is, you know, for a pair of dice, you look them up here if you find them, and if you don't find the pair in here, then you look up each of the separate pieces in here. Um, so I wrote uh, a lambda to score that, um, which is this guy right here. Um, and, well, let's just grab it and pull it out. It'll be easier to read on the screen. It looks like a bit of a mouthful, but it's it's actually relatively simple. Um, so it just says, try looking it up. So X look up arrows in, I, I knew because I was writing a lambda, I was only going to be using, referring to each of these once, so I didn't even get around to naming them, but look it up in the list of combination, returning from the points for the combination. Uh, <clears throat> and then if that's an error, you could also just put all of this other stuff as the fourth argument to XLOOKUP, which is the if error, but I guess I didn't think of that at the time. Uh, and then if that's an error, then you look up the left-hand piece of it in here, returning from these points, and you look up the right-hand piece of it in here, returning from these points. And so <coughs> that way I didn't have to just, I just didn't have to keep rewriting that. So here, uh, I just wrapped it in an N because um, if you don't, <laughs> Pardon me, I'm still a bit sick today. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you don't, then you get your bust and your end of turn in the mix. So I just wrapped it in an N so that it would give numbers there. Um, so that was a good choice. <laughs> and I had a cumulative scoring version of that, which was a little borderline, but probably also a good choice. Uh, so this was for levels two and three. Um, and the idea was it just said, uh, I don't know why I did... Oh yeah, sorry, I was thinking I should have done scan, but no, reduce is the right answer. Uh, so it basically says start from a score of zero and go through an array of of scores as generated by the score lambda. Um, and if you hit bust, then go back to zero. Otherwise, uh, take your cumulative score so far and add the number value of, of the new piece. Uh, and so that just looked like this. So I used mid uh, to break this into um, steps of two. So, you know, there, there were 20 arrows in a string here, so I t took a sequence of 10, uh, starting at 1 in steps of 2, so in other words, starting in positions 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, etc., and took two arrows from each of those positions, scored those pairs of arrows, cumulative scored those, uh, worked very nicely. Uh, and it was basically the same thing here, uh, except that, let me just show you this, except that you had to split the players in two. So... Um, <coughs> I just did this, which was the same thing except laying out the sequence across two columns. So this is like player one's first move, player two's first move, player one's second move, player two's second move, player etc. Et and then I could just kind of scan down each of these columns with the same logic as the previous level. So this this whole chunk here was just named both, and then I just took the cumulative score of the first column of both and the cumulative score of the second column of both and took the max of those. Nice and simple. Uh, level four and five, this is where the, the bad design choice came in. So this is my original version of that, and I had uh, cumulative scoring, you know, tailored for level four and five. This was just, <clears throat> it was a little too complicated. Um, 
a little too much going on. So here I was trying to figure out, oh, th this is actually the corrected version, uh, where I say if it's, um, if it's text, uh, anyway, it, don't worry too much about the details. Um, so if, if it's text, we carry it over. So in other words, if, if you've busted or ended turn, then that just carries on no matter what comes up next. And then if the next thing is text, in other words, the next thing is a bust or an end of turn, um, then you just take the first letter of that. Otherwise, you keep adding up. Um, so the, you know, <clears throat> this, like I said, this is the corrected version and it worked, but it was too complicated uh, in the one I originally wrote. So m when I came back and tried it again later, uh, I just laid it out across. So you know, I did the score <clears throat> uh, based on the, the sequence of arrows. Um, and then just did a simple, you know, turn that into, uh, you know, a B if it's bust, an E if it's not, etc. And then here, it's just the same accumulation logic as as the lambda that just says if, you know, if the previous one is text, so like here, for example, you've gone bust, so you just carry the bust over. If the previous one is text, you keep it. Uh, <clears throat> if the new move is text, meaning it's bust or end of turn, then you just take the first letter of that to record that you've lost otherwise you keep adding up so same logic but it just lets me kind of see it all laid out here so it's quite easy to see okay my b's are carrying across my e's are carrying across um <clears throat> that yeah that that was the smarter way to do this i think uh but not how i did it anyway so that's my good and bad design choices for the first question let's go look at the next one which is oh yeah cricket darts so <clears throat> i think my my good design choice here uh, more by luck because I was the instructions uh, were not quite as clear in the original uh, version that I was testing. Um, but key thing here was you had um, so for any number you could have a single, a double, or a triple. Um, and if you got a single that was one point toward opening the number, if you got a double that was two points toward opening the number, triple was three points toward opening the number. Uh, and then whatever once you got to three points toward opening the number, then anything else could be a score. <laughs> So I just decided to treat the bull and the 25 as another number. Uh, so let's just go the model here. Um, so, you know, here uh, I extracted numbers. I just converted, um, I just converted 25 into a bull. Um, so I said, if it's 25, then bull. Uh, and then, <clears throat> so here, for example, my D18 becomes, the number is 18 and the count is two. Uh, my S17 becomes the number 17 and the count is one. So for the bulls, uh, a bull became a count of two and a 25 be became also a bull, but with a count of one. And that meant that I could apply the exact same scoring logic to uh, to a bull as I did to the other one. The bad design choice that I made here was I thought, okay, well, players <clears throat> are taking three throws at a go, so I should wrap it into a turn. So here's a turn, here's, a, here's all the logic for a turn, here's all the checks for a turn, etc. But if you get ahead of your opponent at some point during a turn, then you stop throwing darts. And because of the way I set this up, it was all, um, it, you know, it was all looking across the turn. So like for level four, I came up with some kind of hacky workaround to, you know, pull out and basically reproduce one dart at a time what happened in level four. For level five, it was too, too complicated to do that. Um, the, the plus is that because it was laid out with dynamic arrays for the wrapping, when I came back to do an alternative version, uh, it was relatively easy to just, uh, you know, get rid of the wrap and have these spill out, and then most of these formulas stayed the same. I wasn't able to get that done in the 30 minutes, but uh, this this would have been the better way to set it up, but it didn't do it. Anyway, good and bad design choices. Uh, I think that's everything I had on cricket darts, so let's move on. <clears throat> Next up is Lana Banana. Uh, Harry's case. Um, this uh, this was a fun one, um, but I did make a number of bad choices in it. Um, <clears throat> I think number one bad choice I made here, and actually it relates to some of the good choices I made in other ones, was I didn't read through the questions. Um, I was I started this one a minute late. I was very flustered, uh, and I just started answering right away. Um, and so you know, level one was was pretty simple. Level two, a little bit more complicated, but fine. Uh, but for level one and level two, I built this whole unfurl of the grid. Uh, the formulas are all gone here because I, I thought the easiest way to name it was to turn it into a data table um, rather than naming each column. Um, the, the advantage of that is that if I just type equals T for my table, then I can immediately see the list of options available as opposed to, you know, if you 
do something like Alt Shift F3 or something like that. It lets you name all the columns from the top row, but that doesn't make it as easy to figure out okay what columns are available to pull from. Um, but so this unfurl, once I got to level three, like I mean, it wasn't even necessarily the best way to do level one or level two, frankly. But fine, you know, if you have something that works, it works great. It worked for me for level one and two, but then as soon as I got to level three, it was clear that that was totally irrelevant. Um, and so I think if I had read ahead, I would probably not have done this whole, because like the, the whole idea of unraveling the grid is often sort of a good investment once the questions get harder. Um, at least I, I often find it that way, but uh, in this case, it was the investment was wasted time. Uh, so that was a bad design choice. Um, and the second thing, not so much a design choice, just a silly mistake. Um, when I converted the column letter into a column number, uh, I originally did this just by taking uh, code of this and then whatever minus code of A because the first one was B. Uh, and that works nicely for B, C, D, E, etc. But when you get to double letters, uh, code only looks at the first, uh, first letter of what you give it if you give it multiple letters. So these were all treated as A. So that uh, that threw me off initially. Luckily, I found um, one of the answers when I was plugging it in uh, flagged to me that that had been a mistake. And so then I went back to just matching them against here. Um, then uh, in terms of good design choices, I think the, the way that I tackled uh, level three and level four um, was, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I should call it a good design choice. I think it might be the only viable design choice uh, for this one. So the, the idea on level three and four was, uh, you know, you start at any random point that it gives you and you can proceed down, down left or down right. You can take any path uh, and you just have to kind of maximize the number of bananas you can pick up. So if you tried to think about this, like some of the ones that I've kind of demoed recently, like, you know, if you take Bose, uh, you know, all possible permutations, combinations, lambda, lambda, and try to figure out all the paths out of here. So there's, you know, three ways you can go on the first step, then three ways you can go on the second step after each of those. Like, you very quickly get to, you know, th even whatever, three to the power of six is, uh, is close to a thousand. So by the time you get down through, you know, uh, like 40 layers of this, the, the number of possible paths is just impossible. And so I, I had a sort of immediate reaction of like, wait, this is level three, this is medium, this is too hard to be medium. I think the way that they squared the circle on that one was all these, um, all these ones were only from the last two rows. So you could actually do a pretty manual approach, you know, for anything in row 38 <coughs> to figure out I mean, honestly, you could even kind of do it by hand. Like, okay, from here I can get one, two. From here I can get one, two, etc. Um, and then, for you know, it was only for level four that you had to figure things out for higher up. But the kind of neat approach here was um, what computer sciences, computer scientists call dynamic programming. The idea was you just, I, I don't know why I didn't do it for the bottom layer because the exact same formula would have done it for the bottom layer, but whatever. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, yes, there we go. Um, so the idea was, uh, you know, you get one if the square you're sitting on is a banana, and then you take whatever is the best of the three squares below you. Um, and so the idea is you don't have to figure out all the different paths from everywhere. From any given square, you only have to record the best path forward. So on the bottom layer, there, there is, there's no decision to make because there's nothing on the next layer. So you just get one if there's a banana, zero if there's not. For the next layer up, you get one if there's a banana that you can reach on the next layer, and zero if there's not. But now you know all the best possible paths starting from row 39, and so from here you don't have to figure out, you know, there are nine possible branching paths down from here, three by three. You can just say, well, there's a path that goes to here, and I know the best thing from there. There's a path that goes to here, and I know the best thing from there. And there's a path that goes to here, and I know the best thing from there. And that then, once you have that logic, that kind of unfurls all the way up the grid. So that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> level five, uh, basically similar. So in level five, you can't pick up bananas on two consecutive squares. Um, so I, I originally did this a slightly different way. I had two two maps like this that referenced each other. So it was basically, if you're on a banana, you pick it up, but then you take the best from the no banana uh, options you can get to on the next layer. And you know, if, if you're in no banana mode, then you don't take any banana from where you are, even if there is one, but you just take the best of the, you know, can eat a banana options from the next layer. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense when I'm just saying it without anything to look at. Uh, but so 
<clears throat> I got the idea in my head, which is not crazy, not exactly right, but not crazy, um, that to do the bonus question, which required you not just to go down left, down right, uh, and straight down, but also to be able to go to the right, I thought it would be neater if I could consolidate my level five solution into a single grid. So that's what I did here. So the idea is just uh, if if there's a banana on this starting square, then you take one plus the best you can do from the five you can reach in two moves. So in other words, you won't get anything from this layer, uh, but you can get to any of these and carry on from there. If there's not a banana, then you just take the best you can from the next layer. And then that that logic sort of generalized uh, to the uh, to the three banana version. Um, so it's just a little bit more complex to say, okay, these are all the places, if I just cut this out for a second, these are all the places that you could get to in two moves. So like you could go two to the right here, you could go down and right and right, down and then right, down and left and right, uh, or you could go all the different ways uh, with down to get to here. So these are all the places you could get to in two moves. So if you pick up a banana here, then you get one for that, and then the best of the places you can be in two moves. Um, and then the flip side is if you if you don't have a banana here, then it's just the best of all the places you can get to in one move. So uh, that was a fun one for me as a as a sort of you know one time slash recovering computer scientist. Um, but it might have been a little uh, little scary for some other people to try and get past level. So last one is backgammon, <clears throat> um, and this is, uh, I mean, <laughs> I scored well on this one. I wouldn't want to give you the impression that that was a slam dunk because I was very close. Uh, I had less than five minutes left and had nothing after level one complete, so it was it was kind of borderline. But uh, the the design choices here were were basically pretty good. So two two that worked out well for me. Um, uh, so I ended up putting all of these on separate um, tabs, but that's fine. So d two design choices that worked out particularly well. One is uh, there's a kind of twist in the logic here because you know for black you're counting from left to right, and for white you're counting from right to left. Um, so pretty early on, uh, I just sorted the two. Um, so uh, let's see. Yeah. So here. I'm figuring out, so th this is the, the list of characters. So you got some blacks over here, some whites over here. Um, so here, oh yeah, one other kind of good good choice that stood to me well was I almost immediately named a character B and a character W for black and white. That made it much easier to refer to later. I should have done that on the monkey one as well with the banana. Don't know why I didn't. Anyway, so <clears throat> here I'm just figuring out how many black uh, characters are in each one of these, which is just again the classic trick of you take the, figure out how much shorter it gets if you get rid of all the blacks. So you take the length of it, and you subtract off the length of what you get if you substitute all the black uh, tokens for zero. But for white, instead of just doing the same thing, I sorted that by a sequence in in reverse order. And so <clears throat> the idea is that you know there's a logic around if you're in the first, if all your characters are in the 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 sort of goal zone, the first six uh, here, like in this black home area here and white home area here, then you're bearing off and different things happen. Uh, and so just by sorting white, it just meant that I could I could always say, okay, one to six is, one to six means I'm bearing off. So now, you know, the bearing off formula just became, uh, why is this not? Hmm? Oh, right, yeah, because I was pointing to the previous turn. Um, so yeah, it's just the sum of everything after turn six is is zero. The other good design choice that I made here was um, was unraveling the the turns, and that this basically made level four a really easy one for me. Because so the the twist in level four was that if you rolled a double dice, so here you got double five, then you actually got to play four fives. And so uh, if you tried to kind of keep each turn to one row, then you would have to figure out a way to apply four consecutive moves to this and depending on the setup the best move might be to apply you know more than one dice to the same starting point uh, and so that could get quite complicated so the way that I did it instead was uh, I just unraveled <coughs> pardon me I unraveled everything which takes a little bit of uh, kind of two call jujitsu so here for example you're skipping blanks so that you get the five one but you get it just ignores those then you get the four fives uh, and the five two and it just ignores these uh, so then, for everything else, uh, I basically uh, used this trick to kind of, <coughs> pardon me, to broadcast it. <coughs> so I said, if <coughs> if the dice number is, <coughs> sorry, 
if the dice number is not blank, then give me the turn number. Otherwise, give me NA. Um, and then I to call that with option two, which is ignoring errors. So uh, let me just open up some extra columns to show you. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Show you what that looks like. This gives me an array that looks like this. So it's turn one, turn one, error, error, turn two, turn two, turn two, turn two, turn three, turn three, error, error. And so then you can use the ignore errors option uh, in two call to just get. So now I've got, you know, these first two dice are turn one, these next four dice are turn two. And then all the logic is just kind of how do you how do you move one dice? Um, and so the, the, then I'm not going to go into the, the logic of that, but that logic is then pretty simple. Uh, actually, sorry, I will briefly go into the logic because I think my live walkthrough only got as far as level four. Uh, and actually getting it to level five from there was pretty simple. So on, on level four, I said, um, <clears throat> I said, if dice number X, where X is the, sorry, if position number X, where X is the dice you just rolled, so in this case, position five, has something in it, then that you take that one, otherwise you take the highest available one. So the change from there to level five, because it was set up this way, it was, was actually really simple, which was just if you are bearing off and you have uh, a dice available, uh, sorry, a token available on the exact number you just rolled, then take that one, otherwise, uh, because the, the not bearing off rule was the same as one of the rules for the, the bearing off case, which was just take the highest one available. So <coughs> I, I thought when I finished <coughs> finished the case that I was not close to getting level 5 out, and I, I couldn't have got it finished in the 30 minutes, but uh, it probably took me less than 5 minutes because of the way I had it set up to generalize it to level 5. So this one was a, an example of some some generally pretty good design choices. The, the ones the ones that really killed me were one not reading ahead, which cost me, especially on uh, on Lana Banana, that that like unfurl was a total waste of time. Um, two, the the gathering all the moves into a turn, which sometimes works really well, uh, sometimes makes the logic much simpler. But on darts, you needed to be able to look at each individual dart, so that wasn't a good choice. And then I tried to go for too complicated a lambda. Uh, on on past the arrows and that uh, that cost me. That's that's a habit I'm really trying to get out of because I, I find it super interesting to write these complicated lambdas and and you know if you had to if you had to do this sort of you know real world operationalized equivalent of this then writing it as lambdas would be a great move because you know you're never going to have the logic be slightly different this month than it was last month when you're working with the same you know with a refresh of the same data, but when you're doing it in a case like this, you want a little bit of debug mode, a little bit of stuff laid out that you can look at and see what's going wrong. Anyway, uh, we'll see in about uh, two hours <laughs> whether I learn anything from that, because that's when the next round starts. Uh, I'm, I'll probably get this video up before then, but not 100% sure. Uh, anyway, that's what I got for today. Thanks for watching. If you see this before the results come out, then wish me luck, and I'll see you next time.